Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Clinical Trials 101. My name is Monica Bryant and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Triage Cancer. Now before we get into the substance of the topic today, I just have to go over a little bit of housekeeping. All of the callers will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but if you have any questions or technical problems, please type them in the chat box on the side of your screen and we will do our best to address them. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on our website, triagecancer.org. Also, at the end of the webinar, you will be redirected to a quick survey. We ask that you take a few moments to fill it out and let us know what you think about today's webinar. Your comments and suggestions really do help us improve future programming. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Triage Cancer, we are a national nonprofit organization that provides education and resources on the entire continuum of cancer survivorship issues to survivors, caregivers, advocates, and healthcare professionals. And we do this in a couple of different ways. We host a Speakers Bureau of Experts and Survivors available to anybody hosting an educational event. All you have to do is fill out a speaker request form on our website. We also host an educational blog, provide online resources, many of which I'll be pointing to today, and we participate in seminars, webinars, and conferences all over the country. And just to draw your attention to the upcoming webinars that we're going to be hosting um, for the rest of the year, we have one on Medicare, one on how to pick a health insurance plan right before open enrollment season, and then finally, right before the holidays, we will have a fantastic webinar on how to cope with stress. All of these webinars are completely free, and you can find the descriptions and more information on our website. And if you've missed any of our past webinars, you can also view the recordings at triagecancer.org. And then I just wanted to highlight the last in-person Triage Cancer Conference for 2016. These are free one-day events open to patients, caregivers, survivors, advocates, healthcare professionals, we talk a lot about health insurance, clinical trials, survivorship, employment, and finances. We'll be in Salt Lake City on October 8th, and complimentary CEUs are offered to nurses and social workers. So for more information or to register, again, please visit our website. Now, we're able to provide these webinars for free thanks to our supporters like Science 37. Science 37's mission is to accelerate biomedical research to help patients who are waiting for cures. They're really transforming clinical research by simplifying trial participation and connecting patients to the world's best scientists no matter where they live. More information about Science 37 and all the great work they're doing can be found at their website, which is science37.com. Also on our uh, website under the resources tab, we have more information about them on the clinical trials page. So thank you so much to their support and for allowing us to bring wonderful webinars like this one. Now my co-presenter for the day is Dr. Susan Love. I am absolutely honored to have her participate today to share her vast knowledge. She has dedicated her professional life to the eradication of breast cancer. She is the Chief Visionary Officer, which is one of my most favorite titles I've ever heard, of the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation. And she oversees an active research program centered around breast cancer causes and prevention. Now, Dr. Love has always been a pioneer and entrepreneur. She has a reputation as an activist and is really one of the founding mothers of the breast cancer advocacy movement. Um, she also brings an incredibly in unique perspective in that she's not only a healthcare provider, but she also, unfortunately, had to see the other side of all of this when in 2012 she was diagnosed with leukemia and underwent chemotherapy and a stem cell transplant. She comes to us today with an incredible amount of professional knowledge and personal experience and perspective about many things, including clinical trials. So uh, I will definitely be interested to hear what she has to say and be turning it over to her in a little bit. So without further ado, let's get into the substance today. We generally, when we're talking about a topic, like to put it into perspective through some statistics. And when it comes to clinical trials, we know that fewer than 5% of cancer patients are participating in them. And there might be several reasons for that. So one study found that only 44% of patients were even told about a clinical trial that they were eligible for and only 20% were offered enrollment into a phase two or phase three trial. 
So we know that there are significant barriers to participating in clinical trials, and what we want to do is try to cope with some of those barriers. So what exactly is a clinical trial? The technical definition is a research study that prospectively assigns people to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. But what does that actually mean? In the context of cancer, clinical trials are studies that are testing new ways to do things. And it could be a new way to prevent cancer, it could be a new way to find or diagnose a particular cancer. Maybe it's about treating a cancer. And then some clinical trials are really focused on dealing with symptoms and side effects from treatments that we already have, all of which hopefully will go towards improving quality of life. Now, the bottom line is that most of the medical and scientific advances that we've had in this country and, frankly, in the world have come from a clinical trial. And the reason that we thought it was so important to host this webinar and to be talking about this issue is to make sure that people understand what it means to participate in a clinical trial and then also to encourage participation where it's appropriate because it's the only way we're ever going to get new treatments and possibly ever a cure. So some of the nuts and bolts about clinical trials. Clinical trials are grouped into phases, depending on where they are in the process. And each phase is designed to look at something a little bit different. There are phases zero through four. However, most studies are gonna go phases one through three. In a phase one trial, for example, you're typically gonna have a small group of people being tested, around 15 to 30 people. And the general purpose is to perhaps find a safe dose of a particular medication, or even to decide how best to administer the treatment. So for example, does the drug work better in a pill form, or does it need to be through an IV? Should the treatment be given in the morning, or only at night, or some sort of mixture, et cetera? Also, phase one trials will typically look at if there's any side effects to that particular treatment. If a treatment is deemed safe, then it will move on to phase two. In phase two, the drug or treatment is given to a larger group of people to see if it's effective and to further evaluate the safety. And phase two trials are gonna be generally a little bit bigger, around 100 people. And then phase three is where trials generally get very big. It could even be up to several thousand people for a, a big study. And in phase three, this is where we're going to confirm the effectiveness of a particular drug, continue monitoring side effects, maybe compare it to an existing treatment that's commonly used, and to collect any other information that will allow the drug or the treatment to be used safely moving forward. Now, phase four trials are studies that are done after the drug or treatment has been marketed to the general population. And they're done to gather more information about the drug's effects in various populations and to see if there's any side effects associated with long-term use. Sometimes the trials will be designed where these phases may be combined. So maybe phase one and phase two are gonna end up being combined, but generally speaking, you're gonna get phases one through three for any particular treatment. So let's say that someone might be interested in participating in a clinical trial. How do you actually go about finding one? We believe the first step is to talk with your existing healthcare team. They may be aware of clinical trials happening in your backyard or be able to point you in the right direction for a particular trial. If that's not possible or if you're feeling like your healthcare team isn't able to help you find a trial directly, there are a number of online search tools and matching services that you can access independently. So you can do a little legwork on your own. And if you find something that's a good fit, you can take that information to your healthcare team for their input. So the American Cancer Society has a uh, clinical trial matching service. National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health are all incredibly reputable places to start your search. 
but they can be a little bit overwhelming. So again, enlisting the, the help of your healthcare team is always a good idea. Now, there are also some services that are specific to a particular cancer, like breastcancerclinicaltrials.gov is focused on matching or providing information about clinical trials specific to breast cancer. So to know that those exist as well. Now, every clinical trial is gonna have a different set of criteria in order to be eligible for participation. And even if you are eligible based on that criteria, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be accepted into that particular trial. So some trials may only accept a certain number of patients and may have reached their cap by the time you apply, or perhaps they're only looking for patients that have been diagnosed with stage two cancer and you've been diagnosed stage one or stage three. Or you may want to participate in a trial and you're not deemed eligible because you've already had different treatments. So there are multiple things that the trial is going to be looking for and trying to weed out so that they can really make causal links between um, health status and efficacy of the treatment. Now, the good news is if you're not accepted into a trial, you may still be able to request a special exemption to access it. The special exemption means that you would be able to get whatever treatment was being tested in the trial, but your results wouldn't be included in the research study. The Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, also has a program called Expanded Access that allows certain individuals access to drugs or treatments that haven't yet been approved by the FDA. And there are pretty strict guidelines for the Expanded Access program uh, so we've given you the link here for more information specifically about this FDA program if you're interested. You will have to have the assistance and sign off from your uh, specific healthcare team in order to be eligible for this expanded access program, so keep that in mind and make sure you're talking with your doctors about it. Now, you may be asking yourself, why would I even want to participate in a clinical trial? And just some of the reasons that you may want to think about this include the fact that you might be able to access new drugs or treatments that aren't available to anyone else just yet. Also, with clinical trials, you're going to be monitored very closely for side effects because a lot of times that's what they're looking for. And then certainly you're, you have the opportunity to contribute to the greater good in the hope that the research that you're participating in is going to help others down the line um, in addition to helping yourself. And then also you may be able to take a more active role in your healthcare by participating in the clinical trial. And that's where this idea of informed consent comes into play. So in this country, there are numerous protections in place for patients who are participating in clinical trials. And any individual who's considering participating in a clinical trial will have to sign what's called an informed consent document. And what is likely gonna be included in this document are the specific protections. Um, and it will also include information outlining the process of the trial, the possible risks and benefits. It'll include information about patient rights, like your right to privacy, or your right to ask questions about the trial, uh, about your right to leave the trial without penalty. That's a big misconception for people where they feel like once they sign on to a clinical trial, that's it. They have no opportunity to leave the trial if they're unhappy, and that's just not the case. So the bottom line here is that you're not giving up rights by joining a, trial, a clinical trial, but instead you may actually end up with additional rights. Now, we'd be remiss if we didn't also talk about some of the risks of a clinical trial. Um, there are risks involved in every type of treatment. But with clinical trials specifically, there may be some side effects to this new treatment that you're getting that doctors can't anticipate yet. That might be what they're looking for in the clinical trial. Of course, it might not be effective for you, so you may not benefit from this new approach being tested, even if other participants are. 
And then many clinical trials are really time intensive. You may have to travel out of state, or even if you're participating in a trial that's close to home, you may have to have additional appointments or spend time keeping really close track of certain side effects and reporting those side effects, more so than if you were just receiving a traditional treatment. Now, we travel all over the country talking about issues like clinical trials, and we've been asked about some common myths. And perhaps the most common concern that we hear from people is that if you sign up for a clinical trial, you might end up getting a placebo or a sugar pill rather than real cancer treatment. But the reality is for cancer clinical trials, placebos aren't typically used. And if you are in the rare situation where a placebo is being used in a study, you are absolutely going to be given that information before you sign that informed consent document. And the way that it would work in a cancer clinical trial, most likely if they're using a placebo, is that they're giving a standard treatment, let's say chemo, plus another drug on top of that. And they're testing perhaps how that other drug is beneficial. So in this study, maybe you get the standard of treatment plus the drug, or you get the standard of treatment plus placebo. So it's not that you're not getting any treatment at all. So both groups are gonna end up getting the standard of treatment. And I think it's a really important distinction to be made that in this country, you're never gonna join a clinical trial and not get at least standard of treatment. The other major myth that we hear is that only, the only people that should be considering clinical trials are people who have tried everything else and nothing else has worked. But the reality is, is that there's clinical trials for all types of situations. Yes, certainly some trials are for patients who may be deemed to be terminal, but then there are also trials for people who are high risk and haven't even been diagnosed with cancer and everything in between. So I definitely urge you wherever you are in the process to, if you're thinking about clinical trials, to not let your stage or your diagnosis stop you from at least investigating them. Now, this has been just kind of a brief overview and I, I've given you a lot of information in a short period of time. So I did just wanna highlight one resource for you. The American Cancer Society and Genentech have partnered together to provide information about participating clinical, in clinical trials. And uh, full disclosure, Dr. Love and Triage Cancer CEO both appear in these videos, but it's not the only reason that we think they're great. Um, they are short videos that break down particular topics to help you understand clinical trials and make choices about what's best for you. And so you can watch one of or all of the six videos, which cover considering a clinical trial, picking one, discussions with doctors, informed consent, and so on. Now, the topic of finances and insurance coverage for clinical trials comes up a lot as well. And again, it's really important to talk with your healthcare team and your health insurance company to find out what coverage you have for participating in a clinical trial and what out-of-pocket costs you might end up paying. Now, thanks to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as the ACA or Obamacare, most private insurance companies are required to provide coverage for the routine costs involved in your healthcare when you participate in a clinical trial. The routine costs often include visit, office visits and blood tests and imaging scans that you would receive if you were getting the standard of care. Also, insurance companies cannot drop your coverage or refuse to let you take part in a clinical trial. Now, insurance companies under the ACA are not required to cover the research costs that are specific to the trial. So if the trial is asking you to take extra blood tests or imaging scans. However, most of the time the clinical trial will cover those costs itself. So very important for you to understand what it is that your insurance company is going to be covering and what you're gonna be responsible for out of pocket. Now, some states, also have laws that offer additional protections for consumers. And on our website at triagecancer.org, 
backslash state laws. We've indicated which states have laws on clinical trials, so you can get more information about that. So that's insurance coverage for private insurance, but what about government health plans? The, there are different rules for government health plans, such as Medicaid or Medicare, and it's important to know that the federal government does not require state Medicaid programs to cover clinical trials. Under Medicare, Medicare is more similar to the private insurance, where it will cover the routine costs of items and services in covered research studies. So I've given you links here for more information about insurance coverage for these other types of government plans. And then there are some costs involved in participating in clinical trials that will likely not be covered by insurance. So it's important for you to talk to your health, to the clinical trials representative about these potential costs so that you can make informed decisions. So get information about if you're going to have to travel for treatment, what the time commitment is. Do they think you're going to be able to keep working or do you have to take time off? And how is that going to affect your finances and your life? How is it going to impact your family life? And is there anything else that you are concerned about that the trial may affect? These are just some examples of things that many people are concerned about, but maybe you're concerned about, are you going to be able to continue walking your dogs? That's something that you should be asking about for, um, before you sign on to a clinical trial. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Love to talk about some of the issues around participating in clinical trials from her perspective, and specifically about communicating with your healthcare team and how you can go about doing that. So Dr. Love? Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, I think that you did a great presentation um, of clinical trials, and I think it's important for people to know that they're not just cancer that um, there are clinical trials on heart disease, there's clinical trials on um, uh, everything from allergies to vac vaccinations. This is the general way that we approve new treatments and new drugs in this country, and even tests to see if treatments that somehow snuck in there really work. I mean, when I first went into practice, it was common practice for people to um, use hormone replacement therapy uh, uh, when they were coming into menopause and to stay on it for the rest of their lives because uh, it was the theory was that you weren't supposed to go through, we weren't, women weren't supposed to live this long. And um, we artificially, our lives were being prolonged beyond menopause, so we needed to prop them up with hormones. Um, luckily, uh, when we had a woman head of the NIH, Bernadine Healy, she did a randomized trial looking at hormone replacement therapy at, versus a placebo in women and showed that the women who took it had more breast cancer and more heart disease than the women who didn't. Um, so we, if we hadn't had that clinical trial, we probably still would be putting people on drugs based, based on myth and innuendo. So it's not just cancer. Um, it's really everything. It's it's uh, medical devices, uh, um, as well as all kinds of drugs. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of clinical trials done um, on surgery, uh, and there should be more. Um, there was one uh, recently done on uh, meniscus tears for knees, and they randomized people to have just an incision, go to sleep, have an incision on your knee, sew it up, and wake you up, versus fix the tear, no difference which um, should give most orthopedic surgeons pause. So it's, we really need to be doing more clinical trials than we actually are um, if we're going to assure that we all are getting um, the best kind of care. Now, in terms of why would you want to be in a clinical trial um, as preferentially, and the, the answer really is because it's your chance to get um, a, the better option, the thing that's out there that um, nobody knows about. And some examples from breast cancer, which is, of course, my field and what I know best, um, was the clinical trial that, that um, was just studied and just completed as I went into practice where women were actually, and these women are heroines in my mind, 
randomized to either get a lumpectomy and radiation or a, ra a radical mastectomy. So randomly cho chosen out of a hat which operation they would get. And lo and behold, the lumpectomy and radiation was just as good, had just as good, uh, had just the same rate of local recurrence and the same rate um, of survival. So that really established that we didn't, more was not necessarily better. Um, another um, very important clinical trial, uh, when I was going on just as I was moving out to California, um, there was a hypothesis that if a little bit of chemotherapy was good for people who had breast cancer, maybe more would be better um, because not everybody who got chemotherapy for breast cancer was surviving. So maybe we should give more chemotherapy. And it was just about a time when we had figured out that you could take somebody's bone marrow out and stick it in a freezer and then give it back to them. So we said, what if we took their bone marrow out of them, because that's really what gets damaged with chemo. We'll stick it in the freezer, we'll blast the hell out of them with chemo, and then we'll give them their bone marrow back again. High-dose chemo with stem cell rescue. And people were actually suing their insurance companies to get access to this treatment, which everybody thought um, would be the answer to breast cancer. Well, luckily, there was a randomized controlled clinical trial which showed that, in fact, more wasn't better, that it was more important that you had the right kind of treatment for the right kind of cancer than it was that you had a higher dose. Um, and now that's no longer being used. That led the way to, to and it shows you that the real advantage of, chemothera of uh, clinical trials, uh, besides figuring out what's best and being willing to be part of that, but also you get access to new drugs. And in breast cancer, the big exciting thing that was happening um, in the mid-90s was Herceptin. So we had just figured out that women whose breast cancer is overexpressed, um, HER2 new, which is a, a protein um, a on their cancer cells, they had the worst prognosis for breast cancer. Chemo didn't work that well. They weren't sensitive to hormones. And it was determined uh, that you could block um, that overexpression with a drug called Herceptin. One of my early patients, one of my patients in Boston, I sent out here to UCLA where they were doing the initial trials um, to get the first antibody to Herceptin, which was actually a mouse model, and she did very well. Um, and subsequently, there were women with metastatic disease who really had no other options, who participated and over their tumors overexpressed her too new, and they were participated in this trial. And, um, and saw a complete remission. So this, this showed that maybe more wasn't better, but maybe having the right drug for the right treatment was better. And, and now what we're seeing um, is even an extension of that where some people, particularly people with metastatic disease, are having their tumors tested to find out what mutations their tumors have. And then sometimes the drug that works for that is not necessarily um, a drug that's commonly known for their cancer. For example, Herceptin actually works for some stomach cancers, even though it was originally developed for breast cancer. So some of these um, new precision medicine clinical trials also can give people access to treatments that they may not other, um, ha otherwise have or, or access to, to new diagnostics or new ways of analyzing their tumor that give them um, um, new options. So, in general, I'm I'm a vast a, a big fan of clinical trials um, and participating in them. Now, as a physician and a, and as a surgeon, why don't doctors bring them up more, and why don't they mention them? And I think it's a combination of um, control and well, really control that a lot of times the clinical trial means you have to have it you have to participate with a doctor that's been approved to be participating in the clinical trial and your local doctor may feel feel he's going to lose a patient um and so he'd rather or she um not encourage you to be in a clinical trial um unless really they've run out of all options um so sometimes you actually have to look into it yourself and see what the choices are, stay, stay.
stay abreast, as we say in the breast cancer movement, of what's out there and um, and really ask questions. And even at the risk, God forbid, of making your doctor feel bad. Um, I think particularly for women, um, we are like to be, and, and having had cancer myself, I, I fell right into this trap. We want to be good little girls. We want the doctors to take care of us, and we don't want to make them mad because maybe then they won't take good care of us. And you sort of regress when you are, have a, a potentially fatal disease, and this is not surprising. But we really have to realize that um, sometimes we have to advocate for ourselves um, to really get um, uh, uh, what we want. And there are, there are ways that sometimes doctors can continue taking care of of, of their own patients and participate in clinical trials or be part of a larger network. But sometimes it's just more trouble and it's more paperwork, and so um, they don't bring it up, and you have to bring it up. So sometimes it's actually possible, but it's not always presented to you as an option because it's more work for them. They've got a lot of patients, more paperwork. They may not have the staff to help um, do all the paperwork that goes with it. So uh, it's something that I think we have to educate the public in more and more because the more we participate, not only do we get better care ourselves, but we also help to change and and learn and move forward in terms of the best care um, for treatments. So I I, I encourage um, everybody to not only uh, ask, um, go, and if your doctor doesn't seem very receptive, look online, reach out to the local advocacy groups, um, or go to one of the websites um, uh, that was so um, well presented earlier. Um, and and be an advocate for yourself. It's hard. And sometimes, I mean, some of the clinical trials are also for after treatment, you know, looking at collateral damage, looking at what are the consequences of treatment. And it's the only way we're going to move things forward. It's a way to get the best care for you as well as the best care for the people who are coming after you. And with that, I think I, I'm ready to open it up to questions because I'd rather see what people are interested to hear about um, and, um, uh, and, and do that directly. I will say that the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation has um, an army of women uh, which it, you can sign up for. It's really a um, uh, an email list. It sounds fancier, I must admit. But <laughs> the scientists who are doing studies, and, and this includes clinical trials, uh, will reach out to us. Um, we'll vet the study with our group of scientists, and if it looks worthwhile, we'll e-blast it out to everybody who um, is willing uh, or, or is on our list. And the reason we do that is we don't try to match. Um, We try to put it out there so that you may not match, but you may have a sister or a friend or someone else that matches perfectly, and then you can um, share it with them. And so we find every time we put a study out, it gets virally sent out further. And you can sign up for the Army of Women on the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation website, um, and we would be happy to have you join us. A lot of times doctors say to me, we don't know how to find women. And I go, well, I know how to find women. Uh, and we are happy to serve as an intermediary. Um, somebody, um, the, the question is, uh, how do people get a better idea of where they are, of what they're there from the beginning? Um, and I think that... Um, that Should we call it clinical trial because it turns people off? I think we should call it clinical trial. I think, you know, coming up with some euphemism is is not really helpful. I think it is a clinical trial. And uh, what we need to do is explain better to everybody what that is and why that may be the best care. In fact, in in Europe, where they have single-party payer healthcare systems, um, they present everybody with a clinical trial. And uh, they actually fill their clinical trials a lot faster uh, than we do. Um, So a lot of the data that we use here comes from Europe. And I think part of that may be a different uh, way of running the healthcare system where um, with a single-party payer, 
it's not so much I'll lose the patients, I'll lose the money, and you can keep it. Um, uh, uh, you can keep it. Uh, keep the patient um, and and participate. Um, so I think we we really need to 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 uh, get the word out that the best care you can get is may well be through a clinical trial, and that even after you've had your care, you may be able to participate in a clinical trial about the consequences of treatment or about treatment for the collateral damage. Maybe there's a study you can be in about post you know chemo neuropathy, um, and I think those kinds of uh, uh, studies are equally important. So we have to train ourselves as patients um, to always ask, is there a study I can be in? Is there a clinical trial? And if nothing else, it'll sort of give a little prod to your doctor um, to be more aware and that that's something you actually really want. Um, uh, one clinical trial, if the doctor isn't being, uh, one question, if a doctor isn't being supportive, can the clinical trial managers help me talk to them? Absolutely, they can help you talk to them. Um, and very often they're very good at it because this is something that they've been trained to do and they've done before. And, um, and so you should, you should get all the help that you can get. But don't be scared. I mean, you know, I think as women we get a little scared about going up against our doctors and then, and, and doctors most, more often than not will, I mean, will help you rather than not help you. Um, uh, if you ask, but if you don't ask, you know you'll never know. Uh, another uh, question about the reason studies aren't getting the answers: Are there much too much too restrictive? Maybe is the word I can't uh, that they that he was trying to say. Um, yes, sometimes the studies are, but sometimes to get the answer you want, you have to control everything except for the question. Um, so you have to control that all the other treatment they're getting is the same, and the only treatment that's different is this extra drug or this surgery or this radiation. Um, otherwise, it's very hard to come up with any conclusions. And so that's the restrictive side. Usually, though, they try to design them in a way that um, the, they won't, there'll be as, the minimal amount of restrictiveness um, and be as open as they can. Uh, and now it's getting easier to do some of that kind of those, some of those kinds of studies. Uh, when a clinical trial is over, can I expect to get rid of some sort of get some sort of survivorship plan to help me transition back to a PCP? That's a really good question. And I think um, if there if it's not being offered, and it probably depends on the trial, then you should ask for it. I mean, the problem with, with it, we all need to be impatient patients. We all need to really um, ask for what we need and demand what we need or we're not going to get it. Um, so I think that some of them probably will give you a, a plan and some of them won't. The other thing is they should give you the results. I mean, not maybe um, uh, your personal results, but when the clinical trial is over, um, really, they should give you, you shouldn't just read it in the newspaper, they should tell you what the results of the clinical trial were. Um, and usually, you know, was the new drug better or not? And some are going to be better and, and some will not be better. Um, and, uh, but that's the only way we're going to find out and go forward. I mean, recently, immunotherapy has been um, uh, the new hot new thing, and why do we know that it's a good, you know that it works in some people because some people participated in clinical trials, and we figured out who were the ones it was best for and who were the ones it wasn't. Those kinds of trials are still going on. So particularly for people with metastatic disease, um, I would ask about: Is there any immunotherapy that you can be part of? Immunotherapy trials. Uh, that you could be part of, and for particularly for certain kinds of cancer, um, uh, prostate, breast, uh, and some of the others, uh, this is working very well. Um, other questions, uh, you can. Uh, I'm keeping an eye out here for you. Um, 
uh, when a clinical trial is over, can I expect some sort of survivorship? We said that. What happens if I'm in the middle of a trial and I just find out I can't deal with it, with it anymore? Be the side effects or the quality of life impact? Well, um, obviously you you are your free agent and you're allowed to drop out. Um, and they do um, keep track of how many people uh, don't continue the whole trial. Um, but the best way for us to get the information is when people um, continue in the whole in the whole trial. So um, the best thing to do if you're having a lot of problems or you can't deal with them is to talk to the people in the clinical trial because sometimes what they do is modify it. If they have enough complaints about things, then they modify it, the trial, um, in order to um, uh, take care of that. Uh, is a question you may not have uh, asking the right question and expand the trial study men. Uh, um, uh, uh, this is a breast cancer question. Since clinical trials, um, uh, maybe we're not asking the right questions, and I totally agree. In breast cancer, we need to we need to uh, include men um, in the trials and. Um, Sometimes what people try to do, and I think this was brought up by an earlier by Frank earlier, that they the they're too restrictive. That in the effort um, to be to really get an answer, they make the people be have so many restrictions of being in it. You have to have the tumor has to be this size, and you have to have had you know only you can't have had these drugs before. You have to be a certain age, maybe a breast cancer study where you can't be male or you can't be. You can't have uh, had other diseases before, and the problem with is a balance because the more restrictive the study, the the better the science will be, but the less people are going to be able to fit into the study, and so you they try to ca make a balance between that where you have a study that has not so many restrictions that you're not going to fit anybody, but not too many, not too open where you're not going to be able to come up with any conclusions because you don't want to participate in a study if it's not going to help people. Um, uh, the question is, uh, maybe you're not asking the right questions. That's absolutely true. Um, what happens if I'm in the middle? We talked about that. Since clinical trials are regulated at the federal level, do potential participants need to prove legal residency studies in terms of um, to participate? I, and, you know, I hate to say I don't know the answer to that. It probably depends on the study. But I think per, I don't, I've never seen a study where that was required, but it may also depend on where the money's coming from and a lot of other issues. It's a good thing, it's a good thing to be aware of. And, um, and it brings another point, that we really need the studies to, we need, you know, studies where we're, we can recruit people with a, from, who speak a variety of different languages, that we can't require only, you know, if you're going to have uh, an informed consent, it needs to be understandable by anybody and it needs to be translated into different languages or we're not going to be able to include the range of people um, who are getting um, the diseases and getting uh, cancer. So I think that um, I don't know the answer um, and it comes from uh, um, Gisemi Lopez, who is a, a great and strong advocate for the Hispanic community, um, and it's a good one. Um, I'll have to look it up. I'll have to check it out uh, to tell you why the answer, what the answer is. Um, the other, you know, the other issue with clinical trials that I have, and I think it's one that as we participate more, um, we're going to have to demand more is. Um, that that you get the results, maybe not your personal results, but but that the results are sent out initially and explained to everybody who participates in the studies. Sometimes we forget to do that, particularly if the study doesn't work. And I think whether the new drug works or not, it's really important, whether it be in a webinar, whether it be written. Um, I think the people who are running the study, if it's a pharmaceutical company, if it's a university, have an obligation to make sure that everybody who participates in the study gets the results of the study. Um, more questions. Um, to see, um, I, you know, as you can tell, I could just keep talking. Um, 
and I will, um, for those of you that are involved in breast cancer, breastcancerclinicaltrials.org is a nonprofit, and they have figured out how to translate um, uh, the clinical trial, the government clinical trial website, into something that is more um, uh, understandable. You can put in your information. They'll tell you what trials you match for, and then you can and who to contact. And uh, it's much clearer. Um, I don't know for other cancers. Uh, I haven't seen um, uh, the same. But some cancers, um, for example, leukemia, uh, is not that common um, as, say, breast cancer or prostate cancer is. And in that situation, um, you can go to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and they usually know all of the clinical trials um, that are that are going on. So going to the nonprofit that focuses on the type of cancer that you have is another uh, resource for finding uh, clinical trials. Um, so here's someone who said they missed the first part, first half, but if they live in a remote area, how can they help? Um, you can live in, in a remote area and still participate in a clinical trial. Sometimes you have to travel, and sometimes the trials, depending on who's funding them, may have some travel information. Um, but it's a good way, actually, if you live in a remote area, you don't have access to um, the you know high-level specialists. You might have a, an oncologist, but you may not have one that's just specializing in the type of cancer that you have. Um, looking for clinical trials is a way to uh, find that and get in a, w in a way to get a second opinion um, uh, on your type of, of cancer as well. Um, and uh, I got a response as well that Science 37 um, has a clinical trials that allow patients to participate from their home. So there are some trials where you may have to travel to get the treatment, but there are also are um, by looking at sites such as Science 37, you may be able to access a clinical trial that allows you to participate it, uh, participate yourself from your home, um, and it's a different kind of clinical trial model. Um, so try that. It, you know, I, I hate to say that we we people who pay cancer. I don't like survivor because it sounds too triumphant to me. Um, and it makes me feel bad about the people who didn't survive and really did everything right. But people who have experienced cancer, um, such as myself and many of you, that we we are often the ones that people call when they're newly diagnosed. So they, they're they scared and they, they hear that you've been through it and so they give you a call. You need to also say, have you looked into clinical trials? Um, you need to say, sometimes explain to them just a lot of the information we're giving you today, that that clinical trials may be somebody's best bet um, to get a new treatment. And, I, you know, I, I go back to um, um, the image of people with, with um, HER2 new overexpressing cancers who were dying who really got on the Herceptin and, and uh, it was life-saving for them. Um, you, you, these new drugs have to be start, they have to start somewhere. And once they've been proven to be safe, they may be your best bet. And it's really important um, to encourage not only yourself but anybody you know to look into um, the option of being in a clinical trial. Um, more questions from anybody? I'm here. Ah. So, Dr. Lev, thank you so much. This has been absolutely spectacular. You did mention earlier the Army of Women, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to really explain to people how they might be able to sign up if they're interested in getting part, to be part of the listserv. So, yes, the Army of Women is a program of the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation, and we, we do all kinds of research mostly on people because I think too much research goes on in rats and mice. We know how to cure cancer in rats and mice. Um, really well, um, but we're not so good in people. So we, if we want to figure out how to cure it in people, we're going to have to do studies on people. And when I talk to my friends who are doing research, they said, yeah, but we don't know how to find people. <laughs> and so I said, well, I can find people. I'm really good at that. 
And we launched on the Today Show now um, several years ago uh, and asked people to just sign up. We don't take a lot of information from you because that changes. And th today you may say I'm premenopausal and two years from now you may be postmenopausal. Or you may have um, experienced something that you haven't now. So we don't ask you any questions. We just take your email and you log you and a few other simple things so we know the range of the geographic range of who we have um, and the age groups. But um, that's it. And then we send you emails. Uh, researchers come to us with their studies. We vet them with our scientific advisory board, if they're good studies, and they could be clinical trials, they could be studies on um, collateral damage of treatment, they could be any all kinds of um, research, mostly to do with breast cancer on our site, because that's what we focus on. But we then e-blast it out to everybody. So we don't try to match at all, because you may not match, but somebody that you know may match, your neighbor, your sister, um, someone else. And it's a way for you to keep abreast, all puns intended, of the research that's going on in breast cancer. And it's a way also for us to really um, uh, get the word out so that, you know, if you, we only match, then you, would, you might never get an email from us. You'd think you fell off. But actually, it just was no studies exactly fit your you. But if you, this way, you hear about everything and you can forward them on as needed. Um, we are actually even pretty good at um, smaller communities. We had one study we were worried about um, for Vietnamese women, and I thought, you know, I don't know how many Vietnamese women we actually have in the Army of Women, but I don't think it's very many. But we put it out there. We filled the whole study in a day. And the reason we filled it was because we may not have a lot, but we have those Vietnamese women who are active and, and know their neighborhood, and they got everybody. So um, you can go to uh, armyofwomen.org and on the on the internet. Um, you can also see us on Facebook, and uh, you'll you can you know you can repost on your own website. And we get these studies. The faster we can get the studies filled, the faster we can get answers, and the faster we can move on to the next question. So the longer it takes to fill a study, the longer you know it's going to take for us to get to the answer for these diseases. So join us in the Army of Women, um, and uh, we will. Um, and men can join too. I'm sorry that it's called the Army of Women, but we've been part of mankind. So you just have to put up with being part of the <laughs> Army of Women. I like the logic. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions coming in, and we are coming to the top of the hour. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much to all of you who spent uh, your afternoon with us, and thank you so much to Science 37 for the support, and a big thanks to Dr. Love for taking time out of her day to share her expertise and perspective with us. So with that, just a quick reminder that we will be redirecting you to a survey, and please take a few moments just to fill that out and let us know what you thought. Um, have a wonderful day, and we hope to see you on another webinar soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And thank you.